word of God. And <coughs>
So they look good, they talk good, everything was good, you know. You go to their house, they got all of these things. They look super religious. But they were missing something. The Pharisees were known in Scripture to look for praise from men. That means they were acting really holy so that people could go, wow, look at, look at, wow, look at Pastor Brian. Like, wow, he's really holy. But Nicodemus was missing something. He was missing something inside. There were roughly 6,000 Pharisees, and they were bitter enemies of Jesus. And this caused Jesus, he was always rebuking the Pharisees because the Pharisees were, their religion, they're similar to, and especially in a Latino community, we can relate to what religion is like. You know, you come to church, you can't have uh, jeans, you can't have earrings, you can't have a beard, you can't, like, <laughs> that's religion. All of these rules, like, if you don't have a beard and you do wear a long dress, but you're rotting inside, what does it matter that you look out outwardly expressive? Amen? Like, do you really think that God is going to send somebody to hell because they wore earrings? You think Jesus said, I'm going to die on the cross for all the sins, but ugh, the bamboo earring thing, I, I, can't, I can't do that. Or, or uh, Eddie comes to church and he comes to church in jeans right from his job. Like, no, you got to wear a tie because I'm wearing a tie. Like, God, come on, man. Like, God doesn't work like that. But that's what these Pharisees were like. That's why when people go, oh, I see you're into religion now. I always smile and I go, no, I'm actually not into religion. Jesus came to break religion. He didn't come to give us religion. He came to break religion so that we can be free to be in his presence. He came. That's why he shamed. He was always fighting with the Pharisees. Yo, you, yo, what about this? Or what about this? Because they knew the law, but they didn't have the law. So it's interesting that this man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, and I, I understand his, his success because of the calling that God has placed on my life. God has called me in th and this church to preach to the rich people, to preach to the successful people of the world. And it makes sense when I look over my life why God dressed me up in these fancy titles to look like them. You know, he made me a CEO, he made me a nurse, and all of these other things that God has going on in my life. Because the Bible says it's easier for a, man, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. I, when I meet somebody that is successful, I gravitate towards them because somebody that has a successful business, somebody that has money, somebody that has multiple college degrees has a higher chance to perish in hell than somebody that does not have that. Because people that are rich and that are successful, like Nicodemus, they don't need God. Because if they need a shirt, they go and buy a shirt. But the person that doesn't have that says, God, I need you today. So there's a difference when somebody is, is um, social, uh, uh, challenged socioeconomically than somebody who is not. So you have to look at Nicodemus's life. He was a successful person. Right? So I have a, a, a LinkedIn page. And when I look at the people in the LinkedIn page, I think of people like Nicodemus. They got all these titles. They got all these degrees. They got all this intelligence, but they're missing the one thing in their lives. That's why they have, not that, not that education is bad, because I'm educated according to the world standards and according to God's standards. It's not that education is bad. It's that education without the foundation of Jesus Christ is extremely horrible. So you, all these people on LinkedIn, they got all these PhDs and everything, and they're inventors and, and doctors and lawyers and engineers, and they look like they got it all together, but they're missing something. And that's what Nicodemus is doing. Nicodemus is missing something from his life. So he comes to Jesus, verse 2, puppy. He comes to Jesus at night. And I find it so interesting that he comes to Jesus at night because it's almost like, you know, 
when you're with somebody but you don't want everyone to know that you want to be with them so you do dirty stuff in order to find a way to be with them right because the the Pharisees were always going after Jesus and Jesus going after them so I just picture Nicodemus successful he has everything he the Pharisees were wealthy and we'll get into scripture that proves that statement that that the Pharisees were wealthy but he was missing something so he comes to Jesus in the night and he's like yo, yo Jesus yo Jesus can I talk to you for a second because nobody can see him because successful people they don't believe in Jesus as much because it's look lowly that's why the Bible says Jesus left the riches of heaven he left the riches of heaven he left the royalty of heaven to come down and dwell amongst men. That's why I love that the Bible refers to Jesus as not being so good looking, being ruggedy, being in, you know, with, with dusty chancletas and, and dressed the way that he is. Because when you're really successful, you don't have to show it. It's already known. But he comes down and he starts spending time with Nicodemus. And he, the Bible says that he came to him at night. And as much as we want to say, wow, well, he came to him at night, something was bothering Nicodemus that he was missing something there was something in his life there was a void that's why so many people you strive for so much success you want a PhD and elemental P you want all this stuff you want a successful business but really what's happening is is that there's a void in your life that only Jesus can fill that's why you buy one house but then come on that's why you buy one house and then you see somebody else on Facebook that says they bought two houses and now you're like ah oh, now I need two houses and then you see somebody you got two houses and you're like fronting in front of everybody's face look at me I got two houses and then fulanito de tal comes and he buys apartment building with a hundred apartments in it and you're like ah because you're missing something there's something that is missing in your life like Nicodemus there's missing something in a human life the Bible says that God put eternity in the hearts of men he put eternity in the hearts of men that means that you can do everything that you want but that one spot in your heart only eternity fits there that's why you see people so hungry for worldly success and they don't stop and that's what's happening with Nicodemus he has it all and you got to remember the Pharisees, they believed in the divine decree. They believed in moral accountability. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit. Wow, I feel the Holy Spirit really strong right now. Lord, we just show reverence and honor. Let's go forward. Uh, they believed in the Pharisees they believed in the angels they believed in the punishments and rewards of the future they believed in all of these things but Nicodemus he was missing something he was missing something because it says he came to Jesus he humbles himself and he calls him rabbi in verse 2 and he says we know that you are a teacher come from God you understand the power of of Nicodemus to admit that he's admitting to Jesus yo I see something divinely powerful in your life that's a lot that's like a doctor coming up to uh, uh, so a gangster let's say and the gangsters the doctor saying yo I think that you can help me but it says rabbi we know that you are a teacher come from God he's acknowledging Jesus now and he says, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answers. When it said Jesus answered, he never asked a question. But if you look at the end of chapter 2, Jesus is saying that he knows the hearts of men. He knows the thoughts of men. You don't have to ask Jesus. He already knows what you're going to ask him. Because God is omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He already knows. The Bible says before the thought is formed in your mind, he already knows. So when you go to God and you say, Lord, I need help with my kids. He's like, I know. That's why I open up a church so that you could come to it right here. That's comfortable for you. But God, you know that I need my finances. And God is like, I know. That's why I brought that homeless person to you so you could sow into them. 
God, but I need, I, need, I need help with my marriage. I know that's why I had you read the Bible verse that says that man should treat his wife like Christ treated the church so you could die for her. God knows everything. So he comes to Nicodemus. Jesus comes to Nicodemus in verse 3, and he says to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The message on Friday was the same style of message. So I know this is from the Lord because the message from Friday was coming to Jesus in faith, coming to Jesus in secrecy. So Jesus says to him most assuredly, in other versions it says verily, verily. When Jesus says verily, verily, or truly, truly, or most assuredly, it's something new. It's, it's similar to like in the cartoons when they used to go, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Jesus is about to drop something new on him. And it says... Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that word again, I did a word study on that word again. Born again, that word again, it means from above. It means from the beginning. It means a heavenly again. It means to be born again. And Jesus comes to this man. I love, I just love the authority of Jesus, the humility of Jesus. I just love an authoritative man. I love an authoritative presence. I was saying it on Wednesday. I, I like a man. Like, I like an alpha male. Like, I like to be around alpha males. I like to be around strong men. I like to be around men that cry in front of Jesus. I like to be around men that pet a little dog. And I also like to be around men that are bold for the gospel. I like to be around men that are real men. That's what is missing. I like, I like a man's man. And that's what I see Jesus. He walks up to this successful man. He got everything, but he's missing something. He got everything. He got everything. He got the college degrees. He got the girl. He got the money. He got everything. He got everything. And he comes up to Jesus. And Jesus says to him, Rabbi, I know that you are from God. Jesus lays a nugget on him and says to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He comes that night, but he still comes. It doesn't matter how you come to Jesus, just come. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, with all his intelligence, with all of his studying, he's, Nicodemus says to him, what? Like, what do you mean I got to be born? He says, how can a man be born when he is old? So scripture's letting us know that Nicodemus is missing something and he's at the end of his life because as life continues to unfold, you start realizing, man, I've been living 40 years and I still ain't found the fountain of youth. Man, I've, I, I've done a whole bunch of stuff, but I'm still stuck in the same place because Nicodemus, he's missing something and he's trying to understand what Jesus is saying. And look at his response with all of his education. He says, how can a man be born again? How, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He, he's basically saying, what are you talking about? Because the flesh, the flesh, remember, all of us are flesh and spirit at the same time. We live in this earthly suit, but we have a spirit. Amen? So he comes to him and he says, only people of the spirit can understand things of the spirit. That's why when you're talking to people about Jesus and they don't receive it, don't get offended. It's that you're speaking, it's, it's, I'm speaking French and you're speaking Chinese. So when somebody doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, that's why we're supposed to show mercy and grace because we know that their spirit man is not alive yet. It's like you yelling at a blind man for crashing a Ferrari. Like, what are you doing? Like, the guy's like, I'm blind. Why'd you give me the keys? So that's what's happening. He enters, he says, does he enter a second time into the womb? By Jesus saying most assuredly, he's saying that he's giving him knowledge firsthand. Jesus is not saying, trying to make him aware. Jesus is saying, yo, I ordained this. All of his intelligence couldn't save him, verse 4. And then Jesus comes back, verse 5. Remember what I always tell this church when you're reading scripture, read it slow, rightfully divide the word. Here it is a second time. Jesus says to him in verse 5, most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, being born of water, we know that baptism is not a way to salvation. So here, we understand that being born of the water means the washing of the brain. The Holy Spirit is symbolic in Scripture as water. So Jesus is just saying to be sanctified. And Jesus goes on to say in verse 5, 
unless one is born again of the water of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is the flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is the spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. All of his intelligence, he still couldn't figure out what was missing in his life. There's something missing in the life of Nicodemus. And Jesus is trying to put him on, like we say in the hood, yo, put me on. Put me on to what you're doing. Help me. Help me open my business. Help me. Show me your secret will. When you were selling those t-shirts, I said right away, yo, why put me on? How can I help that grow? With the t-shirt saying that we're from Lawrence. Like, how can we do this? Like, how can... And he's coming to Jesus because he's missing something in his life. He's looking at this man performing miracles. He's looking at the following of this man. And he's going... <sighs> Yeah, he got something that I need. He got something that I need because I got it all. I got it all. I got the body. I got the, the images on Facebook. I got the money. But there's something about that man. There's something about that man, Jesus, that he got something that I want. Jesus comes and drops a nugget on him. He's like, what are you talking about? Like, I got to go inside of my mother's womb. I don't understand. Jesus then tells him again in verse 8, in, in five verses, the word born is mentioned. You got to understand the way to read scripture is you got to read it slow. You got to pull the juice out of it. You can't read it like a recipe book, two cups of flour, two bags of donuts, and a bag of peanuts, done. No, it's two cups of flour. Where did the flour come from? And what country was there? What was the political climate? And what does it smell like? And what, and what color is the flour? And what is the... Comp Amen? So now in verse 8, Jesus hits them with the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from. He's trying to help him understand. Jesus is looking at this man, and he's saying, this man has no idea that what he's missing is me, but let me help him. This verse is so powerful because when I'm outside and I feel the wind blowing, I always think about this verse. It's true. Like, you don't know where the wind is coming from or where it's going. And that's the same move of the Holy Spirit that is in this man's life right now. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Ecclesiastes 11.5. Ecclesiastes 11.5, this is Solomon. He goes on, he says, As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. God is talking, Jesus is talking to, to Nicodemus, and he's telling him, Yo, there's so much that you don't even know. There's so much that you know, and the problem is for us now, is that we think that we know. We think that we know everything. I'm 45 years old. When I was 20, I thought I knew everything. If I saw myself right now at 20 years old, me being 45, I get out the car and I would hit myself with a belt because you think you know, right? My first year of pastoring, if God allows me to live further than the first year, I'm going to look back to this first year like I think we're hitting home runs. People's lives are being changed in, in this church. And I'm going to look back at my first year and I'm going to go, oh my God, what a mess. <laughs> because you don't know. There's things that you don't know. And that's why scripture is saying, Solomon is saying, you don't even know how a baby is formed. How the, how, how the bones are formed inside of a womb. There's so much happening in your life that you don't even know. But you live your life by the, by the physical eyes so you can't see far. The more I can see with my eyes, the more in trouble I am. The more I know what I'm going to do, the more I know it's not for God. It's when you're walking like this, and you, you're just walking, and the Spirit says, wait, there's a ledge right there. Go this way. I got a step for you right here. Keep going straight. Keep going straight. That's what it is. There's so much you don't know that the Holy Spirit reveals these things to you and God is explaining to Nicodemus that there's something missing in his life and he doesn't even know Nicodemus answered him in verse 9 he goes again how can these things be it's like I just talked to you for 20 minutes Nicodemus you still don't know what I'm saying and he goes how can these things be Jesus answered him and I, oh, I just love his response 
in verse 10, Jesus says to him, are you the teacher of Israel? Like, I thought, I thought you were with, like, the Sanhedrin. I thought you, I thought you had all this wealth. Like, I thought you were smart. I thought you had a successful business. I thought everything is great in your marriage. I thought you were doing well. On Facebook, it looks like everything is going great with you and Sister Bruni. It's, it's amazing. Like, what, are, are, aren't you the teacher? And he's completely taking the wisdom of man and bringing it lowly. That's what it is. It's you cannot come into the kingdom of God. You can't operate in God's kingdom off of your flesh. You can't look at the cross and try to make rational, uh, uh, rationalize what the cross is or what it isn't. It's by faith. It's by faith. It's in believing, in believing that Jesus Christ died for those sins. And that's why Jesus comes to him and he tells him, are you the teacher of Israel? And you don't know these things? Here it is again. Most assuredly, I say to you, and for my Bible nerds out there, here is the Trinity in this, on display, hidden in the text for people that say that the New Testament doesn't talk about the Trinity. Verse 11, Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify. That we is the Trinity. And we have seen, and you do not receive our witness, capital O, making our a divine word for an explanation of God. Most assuredly, I teach you, we speak what we know, and we testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. This is us, in verse 12. He's telling Nicodemus, if I tell you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? If I tell you things, Sister Jesse, the things of the world that's going on in the world, and you don't even believe, how are you going to believe that the Holy Spirit is the one that went and found you and brought you to, to Jesus? He's telling him, I'm telling you earthly things. I'm trying to put you on to earthly things, and you can't even grasp that. How can you ever understand what it is that I'm telling you right now? Amazing. Amazing how the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God, how they clash in Scripture over and over. Verse 13, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Really quick, that's why those movies, I saw this documentary, a Christian documentary that the movies of people going to heaven, I cried when I saw the movie because we believe so much that we're told. Nobody goes into heaven. Scripture says no one has ascended into heaven. So those movies about the little kids that they went into heaven, if you had a vision of heaven, that's different because I've had visions of the Lord. But there's movies that are making millions and millions of dollars that somebody went into heaven, but Scripture says no one has ascended into heaven. That's why you got to measure everything against the Word of God so that we're not led astray. In verse 14, it goes on, it says, As um, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. This is Jesus explaining to Nicodemus what, the things that he knows, and he's trying to help Nicodemus realize that there's something missing in his life. Verse 14, and Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up. Brother Michael, and we were talking about the, 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 the types and the shadows, right? Look at it right there, that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness because it needed to match what was happening in the New Testament. That's why you need the Old Testament. It's the, it's the foundation of Scripture. Verse 15, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Who, wait, I thought I had eternal life. Nicodemus thought that he had eternal life because he knew the commandments. They thought that, the Pharisees thought that they were saved because they lived the law on the outside because the law wasn't on the inside. And Jesus is saying to him, no, 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 that's not, that's not the way to be saved. So he tells him now in verse 15 that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 13, verse 14, and verse 15, amazing. Verse 13 tells him the son, verse 14 tells him the cross, and verse 15 tells him the faith. He's telling Nicodemus, this is what's missing from your life, is that you have to believe in him. Not only in the law, but believe in him. So you should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16. This is the verse of all verses. Everybody has heard this. It doesn't matter who 
has, uh, uh, doesn't believe in Jesus or not. Everybody has at least heard John 3.16. Maybe not the actual verse, but at least the, 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 the reference of John 3.16. So yesterday, for the people that, that are uh, learning how to preach, I started taking the message and I started making it what I wanted it to be. And the Holy Spirit started telling me, as I was reading John 3.16 and getting my cleverness into the message, the Holy Spirit started telling me, why is that in the scriptures? And I was, and I was like, whoa. Because you want to talk to us about salvation. And the Holy Spirit said, no, Brian, why is that in this passage? I, I said, Lord, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, I'm going to tell everybody that Jesus died on the cross. And the Lord said, no, but why is it in this passage with Nicodemus? And here's the answer. There are 31,102 Bible verses in the Bible. John 3.16 is the most popular. And it's to a man who had everything but was missing one thing. The most popular verse in the Bible was written to a man that was successful. The most popular verse in the Bible was written to a man that didn't understand the most popular verse in the Bible was written to a man who was wealthy. The most popular verse in the Bible was written to a man who thought he was saved. The most popular verse in the Bible was written to a man who thought he had everything. The most popular verse, the most popular verse was written to a man who didn't even know what Jesus was talking about. The most popular verse in the Bible was written to somebody who was so successful that was perishing because he thought he was good. The most popular verse in the Bible was written to a man who didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't know. He thought he had it all. He didn't know. He thought he had it all. There's seven wonders in just John 3, 16 alone. Leave it up, Osiris. Um, as, I, as I go forward, leave it up. There's seven wonders just in one verse. God, the almighty authority, so loved the world, the mightiest motive, that he gave his only begotten son the greatest gift, that whoever the widest welcome believes in him, the easiest escape, should not perish the divine deliverance, but have eternal life, the priceless possession. This is in one Bible verse. This is in one Bible verse. John 3.16 was written to Nicodemus that came to Jesus in the night. Like, yo, Jesus, can I... The John 3.16 was written to a man who was seeking God in private because he knew, he knew, he knew that that man had something that was missing in his life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Osiris, verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who believes in him is not condemned. Let me tell you what this says. He who believes in Jesus is not condemned. That's who him is. Let me tell you who else him is. Whoever believes in the advocate, whoever believes in the Lamb of God, whoever believes in the resurrection, the life, the shepherd, the bishop of souls, whoever believes in the judge, Whoever believes in the Lord of Lords, whoever believes in the man of sorrows, whoever believes in the head of the church, whoever believes in the master, faithful and true witness, whoever believes in the rock, whoever believes in the high priest, whoever believes in the door, whoever believes in the living water, whoever believes in the bread of life, whoever believes in the alpha and the omega, that's the one you got to believe in. It ain't Muhammad. It ain't Muhammad. It ain't Muhammad. You know what? Muhammad is a sinner and he's a child rapist and he was marrying little girls. That man is not God. It's not Allah because Allah doesn't exist. It's not Buddha because Buddha is a statue. It's not Confucius because Confucius is just another man. It's not the Dalai Lama because there is no resurrection. It's whom? 
in him. Whoever believes in him, who is him? The holy one, the mediator, the beloved, the branch, the carpenter, the good shepherd, the light of the world, the image of the invisible God. Whoever believes in him. Oh no, we ain't finished. Whoever believes in the chief cornerstone, the Savior, the servant, the author, come on, come on. We believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus. We ain't buying it. We ain't buying it. We ain't buying it. We ain't buying it. We're tearing down everything, everything that exalts itself above the name of Jesus Christ in this city. Whoever believes in him, all you got to do is believe in him. All you got to do is put your faith in him. Oh, who's him? Oh, let me tell you who he is. He's the everlasting father, the Shiloh, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the great I am, the king of kings, the prince of peace, the bridegroom, the only begotten son. That's who we're believing in. That verse was read to Nicodemus, Isaiah 9, 6. That verse was read to Nicodemus, the most successful Bible verse in the world was written to a man who didn't know he was missing anything. Somebody got it. Bible goes on to say of this Jesus, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. It doesn't say that Jesus, it doesn't say that the son was born. It says a child was born. Because spirit, a spirit needs to have a vessel to live in. So it's that a child was born, Jesus, and Christ the anointed that came from God. That's why it's Jesus Christ. That's why he's 100% human and 100% man. You have to know that. Scripture goes on to say, for unto us a child is born, but a son is given. And the government of the kingdom will be on his shoulders. And his name will be Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, for the Jehovah's Witnesses is that they say that Jesus and the Father are not one. The Bible says that he will be the everlasting Father. So if you don't read the word, you'll be easily astray. For anybody that you know that's a Muslim, when you ask Muslims, what does the Quran say about the forgiveness of sin? Ask them. I love witnessing to Muslims. I love it. When I see a Muslim, I'm like, oh, we doing this today. We're doing this today, but it's always in love. It's always in love. But I asked them, I said, well, how, how does the Quran say that you forgive sin? It says you do a thousand nice things for somebody. And you do away with the sin. Here's the problem with that. What if Richie sins against me and he has to do a thousand nice things? What if those thousand nice things, I don't think they're a thousand nice things and I want him to do another thousand. You see the problem with that? That's called when you have works Base. That means that there's no measurement. There's no standard. That means there's no standard of measurement. That's why the Bible says, whoever believes in him. Who's him? The wonderful counselor. The, whoever believes in Emmanuel, the son of God, the day spring, the amen, the king of the Jews, the prophet, the redeemer, the anchor, the bright morning star, the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever believes in him. God is telling Nicodemus, forget everything that you were taught. Just do this one thing. Forget all of your degrees. Forget all the money that you have. Just do this one thing. One thing. This man was missing and it was one thing. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son. Verse 19, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. People do not, people choose not to love Jesus, not because they don't want to love Jesus. The Bible says it's because they love evil. You see, when you talk to people about Jesus, you have to talk to them at the level of sin because if somebody doesn't believe that they're a sinner, then they'll never need a savior. But what happens is, is that we try to tell people, yo, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. But you have to show them that the darkness in their life is, it, it, it's easy. Because once your sin comes alive, whoa, you have a problem. Once sin is revealed to you, you have a problem. And Jesus is the solution for that problem. 
So it's not that, oh, I just don't, I don't really, I don't really do the church thing. I don't really do the Jesus thing. No, it's that you love darkness. That's what it is. Verse 20, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light. He who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be seen, that they may be done in God. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Heaven is a free gift. Heaven is a free gift. There's nothing that you can do to earn it, and there's nothing you can do to deserve it. Heaven is a free gift. And man is a sinner, and he cannot save himself. We cannot save ourselves. And God, we always love, want to talk about the love of God. But you know what? The same way that God is love is the same way that God is justice. And God is obligated by his word to punish sin. So there's a problem. There's a problem. And the answer to that problem is Jesus who died on the cross for those sins. So that when you see God, you're like, Lord... And he's like, yep, go ahead. Jesus already paid for it. You go right ahead. God, what, what do you mean? You should, like, like, I'm going in? And God's like, yep, he paid for that. And here's what it is. It's through Jesus Christ. It's having faith in Jesus Christ alone. Only in Jesus Christ alone can you be saved. If you don't know if you are truly saved, if you believe that you have sinned against God and you want forgiveness for those sins, come to the front and receive this Jesus. There's something missing in your life and that's what's missing in your life. It's that Jesus has not become your savior for your sins. This is the time. This is the time of the service where now you respond to the message of salvation, to the message of truth, to the message of redemption, to the message of eternity. You're going to see God. You're going to see God face to face. The same way you're looking at me, you're going to see God face to face. The Bible says we see God now through a dim glass. But later on, we're going to see him face to face. You're going to see God face to face. When you see God face to face, you want to have the blood of Jesus over your life. Because the Bible says that the blood of Jesus is what forgives, forgives us of our sins. If you're in this room and you have not said, uh, uh, allow Jesus to come into your life, this is the time. This is the time. It's not later. It's not later because later is never promised. This is the time. Come now. And God always asks to do things in public. He told Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down from the tree. He told Matthew, I'm going to dine with you and your friends. And Matthew's friends came. This is the time of the service. This is the time.